All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our session today in Expert Tips in IBMI Security. We're going to be talking about uh, several things regarding IBMI Security, of course. Hopefully, we'll give you some information and some background in certain areas that uh, you can take and deploy in your own environment. For those that are uh, not familiar with me, my name is Robin Tatum. I'm the Director of Security Technologies here at Help Systems, and that basically means that I am in charge of evangelizing the security conversation as it pertains to the IBM Power Platform and the IBM I operating system. It's certainly my pleasure to be here with you and speaking with you today. I'll uh, make sure you get this contact information at the end of the session as well. That way, uh, if you do have a question and you're a little shy, you can certainly email that to me or follow me on Twitter. And uh, we try to give out lots of good information as we go along. I did a webinar in 2018 talking about some of the biggest mistakes that I see in IBM I security. So I, I basically summarized that entire slide deck into this one slide here to talk about the things that I often see as uh, some of the mistakes that organizations make, be it denial that they are at risk, whether it is the inaction that management often um, finds themselves stalled in, underutilization of tools that exist in the IBM I operating system. There's a lot of things that you have access to, and in many instances, people simply aren't using those things. We're often not prepared. I'll talk a little bit about that as one of the tips today. Uh, we want to make sure that we have an expectation of some si sort of either cyber breach or even a data event that occurs uh, unintentionally from an internal source. So lots of things here. And certainly, if you want to understand more about these particular pain points, these mistakes that I see, go out to helpsystems.com and you'll find the webinar. Uh, available for on-demand playback. One of the things that we find that customers are pretty good at is physical security. So we have an idea that if we need to protect something that we can put it behind closed doors. And that may be as simple as um, you know, a, an office building, lock doors, swipe cards, pass keys, utilizing visitor badges for those that come in on a temporary basis. Of course, many of us store our technology in a standalone data center. And we have security devices like video cameras, motion sensors, and other things. So we kind of have that one down and, and well handled. We also then talk about virtual or rather perimeter security. Many of us have firewalls if we are connecting to the outside world. We have virtual private networks that allow us to connect in from home or, or from remote locations in a secure manner. We segment our network to make sure that if somebody does come in that there are limits on where they can access and, and how they can get there. And then we offer up a demilitarized zone, perhaps for a web server, so that even if that server is potentially compromised, the backend network is well protected. So we kind of have that one handled as well. Now, these two things are fantastic. They're extremely beneficial, and we certainly encourage their use. But there is a tendency then to generate us with kind of a different problem. Now, I'm sure many of you are like me and love uh, M&Ms. Unfortunately, what we find with security is that there is what I call an M&M defense, which is where we have this crunchy or, or protective outer layer but if somebody is inside already or if they get in the inside, then they find that everything is soft and gooey and very, very available. And that's good for M&Ms, but really less than desirable when it comes to security on the platform, which is where we want to have more of a layered approach. We want to make sure if somebody's coming into the network, even if they have authority to do so, we want to make sure that there are limits on what they can do and where they can go based on the type of role that they fulfill for the organization. We layer things like firewalls and object security and user profile settings, much like this nested doll here, so that people can get around to the network and the different servers and services available to employees and contractors, but we have some limits on where they can go. One of the things that's most important when we talk about security is that we understand the entire picture. 
oftentimes there is an expectation from the management team that the IT folks or, or the technical staff are taking care of security. We see questions like this, which are very generic, which simply says, are we secure? Are we at risk? And oftentimes the administrator doesn't know what they don't know, of course, right? So when we indicate that we have an environment that is secure, oftentimes we're evaluating that based on limited knowledge or perhaps um, expectations of users coming in through certain mechanisms. And unfortunately, when we see the big picture, we realize that the controls that we put in place perhaps are not entirely effective. They are circumventable by different users and different means. And this is definitely a problem. This scatter diagram is, is one that I think is extremely valuable. It's put together by IBM's X-Force, and it shows the causes of major data breaches. And what we see from the purplish dots here is that misconfiguration is a very common source or cause of a data breach or data event, and the size of the dot indicates the impact on the organization. So between the, the purple and the gray, and the gray being other, undisclosed, right, and certainly a portion of those likely are based on misconfiguration, we find that this is a significant cause and entirely avoidable in many instances. Of course, we're running on this amazing power technology platform. Regardless of whether you still call it iSeries or AS400, this is power technology and it is designed from the ground up to be a highly securable platform. If you go out to IBM.com, maybe this has changed a little bit since I saw it, but IBM certainly touts that the operating system IBM I is considered one of the most secure in the industry. Not a big surprise. I think many of us have sold the technology to our management company based on one of these types of attributes. Now, secure is really a, a state of mind. It's, it's how we perceive the system. This is a very valuable state. It, it's certainly something that we wish to attain. But the reality is that what we actually are is securable. So even if you're running on the latest power hardware, on the latest OS for IBM I, the reality is that the operating system is pretty open. It is certainly provided with tools and facilities that allow us to convert that into a secure state, but it doesn't come that way by default. It takes work, and that's what we're here certainly to talk. Now, after we've gained some education and some familiarity with the operating system, what I recommend before we jump into remediating any type of security exposure or misconfiguration is that we do some investigation. It's kind of like going to see a doctor before you schedule a major surgery. You don't want to get all the way in and then find that perhaps you've missed something major or that you are treating the wrong or, or, or the most at-risk element. So the first thing we want to do is understand how our system is configured. For me, that starts with analyzing the system state. You can start, if you don't have any commercial tools or have any shortcuts available, by running a number of configuration reports. And I'll give you some of the commands that I would use in order to do that as we progress here through the conversation. Another option for you is to leverage the free security scan software that we make available to anybody in the IBM I community. I'll give you that option at the end if you want to take advantage of that. Thirdly, another option is to have a professional come in and perform a full audit of your system. If you've ever had an audit, perhaps from one of the accounting firms that we're all familiar with, then you may have learned that they're not always as familiar with IBM I as perhaps they should be or we would like them to be. Granted, that may make the audit easier to pass, but at the end of the day, we're trying to gain benefit and a stronger configuration out of this so it is absolutely a requirement that anybody who's performing this task for you is extremely familiar. Often we find that internal people perform this task. Maybe it's the programmer who has more familiarity with everybody else. And while I absolutely agree that that is better than nothing, again, we still have that issue of you only know what you know. And you're going to review the elements that you're familiar with and perhaps not realize that there are other aspects to the system configuration that you are completely unaware of because you're not familiar. Now, I don't know about you, but I am one that likes to have my house in order. Netflix has created an extremely popular series here, and I would offer that if your IBM I security habits are not currently sparking joy, then 
it's time that we adopt some different ones. We need to get our house in order, and that's the first step for me anytime I engage in a security project. Now, I've suggested different ways that we can run reports, uh, whether it's through a professional engagement or just running some configuration information ourselves. But sadly, it's probably not going to be all folded and aligned nicely. In fact, when we first look at our system, we're going to discover that we've probably got about 30 years or so of bad habits that have infested and taken over our house. It's going to take some cleanup. It's going to take some heavy lifting to take care of these bad habits and try to reverse them, get it cleaned up. Now, that's not something that's going to happen overnight. And the other thing that I definitely advise about is that it's a not a one-time operation. Oftentimes, we expend effort in cleaning up our profiles or changing an application and the way that the security works. But the natural state of the world is that we want everything to be open. So if we don't give the security configuration ongoing tender love and care, then what we find is that it will gradually revert back in the same way it has over the last 30 years. So when we clean up the system, it's important that we stay on top of it. And it's much easier to do that with a well-configured system than waiting for it to regress back to that hoarder's house every time and then kicking in a massive overwhelming project in order to get it back into alignment. One of the most in question, important questions that you can ask yourself is what type of applications do we run on this server? Are you predominantly a green screen shop or have you progressed and created web or browser applications? Do you have thick clients within Windows or Mac OS that are providing your users with the line of business functions? Now, the reason this is important is because data is potentially accessed in different ways. And what we find is that oftentimes people have a mentality based on the type of connections that they are most familiar with. Now, when we talk about a green screen application, the native database access can be pretty well contained using non-database security controls. What do I mean by that? Well, let's face it. If you have a green screen application, all you have to do is throw a, throw a menu in front of a user and you'll find that that user is well, pretty well constrained to that application. In the mid-90s, IBM opened the doors to other access methodologies. And this certainly was a catalyst into these different types of applications, these more modernized applications. And there's been a huge emphasis within the IBM I community to open source or different types of more modern applications that are really now leveraging the IBM I as more of a database server than an application server. And this is all extremely beneficial. It gives us a, a better story, a better message to our management teams that the power technology is leading edge and it's not an AS400 from 1991. What we have to remember with this, however, is that oftentimes these PC interfaces potentially circumvent some of the traditional or legacy controls that we have implemented. We talk about ODBC or, or the Java equivalent. We've got FTP, DDM, RExec. We've got NetServer into the IFS. All of these things are not prevent, presenting the user with a menu type environment for the user. So all of a sudden, the user that was originally constrained in their three menu options can now directly connect to the database. And when done legitimately, it's an extremely beneficial capability. But when it's not pleased, it opens up the door to significant risk. Because let's face it, if you're going to be hacked by somebody, either internally or externally, the reality is they're not going to download access client solutions. They're not going to install anything. They're simply going to hit you through industry standard methodologies like FTP. And while these are the most at-risk interfaces, they're also tending to be the ones that we provide the least protection to. So it's great to protect the front of the house, but don't leave the back doors wide open. Another tip that I like to give people is to go through and do some data classification. And the intent here is we're trying to identify what might be sensitive either to the organization internally or externally. Oftentimes, we take a mindset that all data was created equal, and it therefore can seem like an overwhelming task when we have to secure everything. But through data classification, we can identify those high-priority items, put emphasis on securing those elements, 
auditing their access and doing other things that would be much more manageable than the entire database across all applications. I like to use four classifications when I do this, ranging from public, which is openly disclosable. Uh, it may be marketing information. It may be information that leads to sales. Um, it can be anything that really could be left on a on a uh, public park bench and, and really would not cause concern. All the way through then to, of course, restricted data that is not only restricted to people of the organization, but it most likely is also restricted to subsets of those people. That may be payroll information. It may be classified uh, product um, methodologies for how we create our, our you know, valuable products that we sell against competitors. We can also have internal and confidential. These are different ranges between that. These are certainly things that we wish to perhaps limit only to the eyes of employees, but perhaps different levels of sensitivity around that data. Once we do that, again, it gives us the ability to allow us to be more laser focused on the types of information that we should be applying our attention to and makes the task much more manageable. You want to ask yourself who you answer to. Now, for me, it's certainly I've got multiple bosses here at home and, and at the office, but what we really try to do is ensure that we are applying the appropriate levels of rules. Regulatory bodies certainly are garnering the majority of change, whether it's PCI or GDPR that has hit the radar over the last 12 months. These types of governing bodies are giving us the rules as to uh, how we have to engage and how we have to protect that data. Bearing in mind that it's usually the minimum that we should be doing based on the fact that we've shown through history that we don't do a good job of self-policing. Even if you don't have any regulatory compliance mandates, there's probably a, a board of directors, certainly customers or vendors and employees, all of which have a vested interest in not only protection of the data, but also the integrity of the data. Perhaps people don't want to necessarily steal your information. I still hear that a lot. We don't have anything that would be of valuable to anybody or value to anybody outside the organization. But what you have to remember is two things. One, presumably you're collecting that data for a reason. Second of all, anybody hacking from outside is probably not going to know the worth or the intrinsic value of that data until they've already accessed it. So even though you may not have any valuables inside the property, they've already smashed their way in in order to take that, later on determining perhaps that it has no value, doesn't make it any less intrusive or painful. Once you've determined kind of what game you're playing, you want to define some policies around how you're going to control this access. And security policies are, are really just there to map out the requirements. They're often not overly technical. They're best defined by a committee that has visibility to different aspects of the business. And it's really going to help kind of strategize your approach to security. It's critical that you gain management sponsorship in order to facilitate um, getting budget for these initiatives, and then, of course, ultimately the enforcement. Unfortunately, I had a conversation with a customer just last this, this last week whereby they were trying to implement good, better security, good controls, and they were getting pushback from the CIO who simply didn't see the value. They didn't see the benefit that it was bringing to them, and it's going to make it extremely difficult for those people to implement any type of better security because they won't be able to enforce it. Within your policies, you've got to look at corporate directives. You've got to look at whether there is uniqueness in certain geographies that you do business in. Uh, the EU, for example, and the GDPR, of course, is a great example of that. We want to establish what types of expectations we have for our users. When you sign onto the system, we are able to audit your actions. We want them to know that because most people that are on the payroll oftentimes are taking advantage of either um, opportunistic type functions or they think nobody has visibility to their actions. We want to define certain technology aspects in here like password policy and 
data access policy for those applications. And this is what's going to help hold our feet to the fire. It's going to give us a basis for coming back later on and saying, are we doing what our policy says we should do? Unfortunately, so many people omit this effort because they jump right into securing their system. But six months, 12 months down the line, maybe we have different staff now. They have no idea of the expectations if there's not a policy to paint the color inside the lines. Once we have a policy, of course, we've got to address security. And I've broken that down into three different levels. Certainly, I'm being simplistic here. I'm not suggesting that if you check off these three bullets that you're done with server level security. But some of the things that we often find are not taken care of in an IBM I environment are things as simple as ensuring that the communication between the users and the server is secure. We don't want user IDs and passwords and the data that the user is accessing to be traveling across the network in the clear. Because if somebody gains credentials, now they're able to connect into the system just as if they were the user. Single sign-on is a benefit here, whereby we can ensure that there's simplicity for the users. When they connect to the network, we can ensure that there is a token being used that automatically connects them into the appropriate servers. I also find it extremely valuable and a requirement, quite honestly, to have some form of mechanism that allows us to review our configuration settings on a recurring basis. I list these here as system values. Of course, I know most of you are familiar with IBM I and the concept of a system value, but if you're not, it's simply a configuration attribute that stores all of the runtime type settings for our system. And it's important that, first of all, we understand and establish those settings and then ultimately ensure that they stay consistent. There's some solutions within the Help Systems PowerTech portfolio to assist with that. Most popular is the Exit Point Manager. That gives us the ability to see and control PC type access methods, FTP, ODBC. I already mentioned those. There is an infrastructure layer within the operating system called exit points that allows us to apply this as a security layer, augmenting what may or may not be implemented within the operating systems on object level security. We also encourage evaluation and consideration of an antivirus in order to scan and cleanse the integrated file system. Again, depending on how your system's being used, we would certainly garner this as high risk or low risk, medium risk. So part of it is understanding how your data is being stored, how it's accessed, whether you're mapping drives to the IFS, whether you have PC type applications like WebSphere and Domino and Java based tools that are all going to be heavily leveraging the integrated file system. If you've ever heard that you can't get a virus on the platform, that comes with a huge disclaimer. And so you want to make sure that you understand exactly how that is potentially going to impact you. Next, we have user level security. Now, this uh, attractive gentleman here, certainly very strong. Uh, I wouldn't want to come up against him in any type of uh, contest or a dark alley here, but that unfortunately is how most of our users are represented through their profiles. They are extremely overly privileged and powerful. Many times we see upwards of 150 plus users with root level access. That's the all object special authority. So the first thing we're going to want to do when we get to the user level security aspect is to understand who has capabilities that exceed the expectation. That can be done by analyzing the user profile, looking to see which of the eight special authorities they're carrying, whether they have non-limited capabilities. You may have heard people talking about command line permission, but arguably that's just one aspect of the limited or unlimited capabilities. So it's important to understand the difference. We want to determine who has private access to the database and who maybe has runtime attributes that are exceptions to the global system value attributes. Things like the uh, password expiration interval but can be suspended or, or overridden on a profile by profile basis. And you wanna understand who's not conforming to those central settings. It's not a bad thing to have exceptions, but you want to make sure you're aware of it. They need to be business decisions and not just um, unknown or, or missed settings that are slipping through the cracks. 
The PowerTech Authority Broker tool that I've starred here is a great solution to allow you to assign privileges on a temporary basis and then monitor the use of those privileges. So if you have that struggle of, but I have administrators or I have power users that need to be able to run commands, they need to get into interactive SQL. I understand that. Certainly there's people that need to run the system and manipulate the database in different ways, but it's important, nay imperative, that we do so in a controlled manner. You don't want a free-for-all on your system because if somebody does connect in and they accidentally or maliciously decide that they're going to access the data in a way perhaps that is not through the approved application, you want to make sure that there is, a, at a minimum, a breadcrumb trail of how and who did what and, of course, also ideally prevent that from even happening in the first place. No conversation about security is going to be complete without uh, some type of discussion around the database itself. It's absolutely important that depending on some of your other settings that you try to establish what we call a deny by default type restriction. Understanding that IBM I is not shipped in this configuration as a default. In other words, the system and the database intends to be wide open and it is your responsibility to make sure that that is changed. I offer that it is much quicker and easier to secure at the library level than it is to get down to individual objects. Most likely you have far fewer libraries to deal with, which means it's a much easier, more manageable task. If the library security is not granular enough, then you certainly have the option of getting in deeper and saying, look, this is a file or a program within that library that has additional sensitivity. Maybe it's a master file. Normally, it's only viewed by the average user. It's not maintained. And so establishing the ability to see that data but not change it can be beneficial. But don't get that deer in the headlights look because you've got you know 45,000 objects that you have to secure when you realize there's really only three application data libraries that could be controlled and therefore the users are kept to an absolute minimum, the, the core application users that need to be there. There are some facilities in IBM I. Row column access control is something that I hear people talking about without really understanding what it is. But what it comes down to is that it is field level security. And that is an excellent capability. It is another class leading type function that's included in the DB2 database. But don't get carried away. So many of us are not even doing system level security let alone library security, let alone object security, let alone field security. So we've got a little bit of work to do before we're ready for the power of RCAC. Understand also that it's not encryption. Even though you can do some masking through this facility, if your regulatory mandate or your security committee has deemed that data would be benefited by having it stored in an encrypted state, RCAC is not doing that. The data in the file is still in the clear, and it's simply being controlled at a record and field level. So it is not technically encryption. There's some programmatic techniques that you can use to empower a user to access a data database, but only when they're using the approved application. We use terms like adoption and swap profiles, which are great ways to allow a program to temporarily allow a user to access a file to perform a task they need, but if they try to get to the file directly through Microsoft Excel or Query or some other database manipulation tool, we can prevent them from doing so. Again, we wanna consider whether users are taking advantage of PC type applications or Query to access the database outside of the application, because certainly if they need to do that, we've got to have a mechanism that allows them to continue to do so. The intent with security is just not to lock everybody out. I, I can disconnect the network cable and secure the database completely, but how much value does that data then provide to the business or the organization? Zero. So the skill in security is not locking it down. The skill is allowing appropriate access in a way that still affords us security but not at the expense of the business functions. We have to acknowledge that application security and menus that many of us rely on are still beneficial, but don't always prevent access. You can put me into a menuing system, but if all I have to do is go to an FTP prompt, which I can access through a Windows DOS prompt, then I can access the database directly and the menu has no benefit at all. 
For those of you on the latest operating system, IBM i7.3, you can use a facility called Authority Collection to determine how much access a user actually needs to a particular object. Less speculation, which leads to less risk of broken applications, arguably the biggest fear and one of the uh, most common reasons people avoid configuring security. They're just afraid of breaking a business application. But authority collection is, is very beneficial in this regard, and certainly I would encourage its use. When we see the of IBM I, I think you'll see some enhancements in there coming as well. Uh, so again, just more and more reasons to use that to assist you in your task. Help Systems is trained in uh, authority collection as well as all the other operating system controls. As I know, you can engage with those folks to assist you in anything as it pertains to IBM I security. It's not just about software solutions here at Help Systems. We have the entire conversation handled ranging from system values to profile configurations to audit, pen testing, and then of course we do have the tools that are the icing on the cake. For data that you feel uh, has some additional more stringent security requirements, then again encryption is an option. DB2 uh, was enhanced with uh, some changes in version 7.1 of the operating system. That was also the time when we saw the introduction of a facility called Field Procedures. Think of these almost as field level triggers. And, and the benefit that you gain from using these in their um, 7.1 state is that they're able to provide really a seamless type of function for the encryption and decryption of that sensitive data. It used to be that you had to change the database structure for the length of the field and potentially the type of the field, which had a significant butterfly effect into the application. We then had to change our application program so that they could decrypt at the appropriate time and re-encrypt before the data was sent back to the database. And all of this now is happen, happening down in the machine interface, down in the database layer, and it allows us to potentially utilize encryption and the benefits that comes with without even making a line of change into the code itself. Now, there's still some responsibilities there. You have to create the field procedures. They are a facility, they're an enabling technology in the operating system, but you still have to write them or purchase them. So PowerTech Encryption has done exactly that. It auto-generates those field procedures for you, and it provides the encryption key management functionality. That is absolutely critical. Of course, your encryption is only as good as your keys, so you want to make sure that all of that is handled in the appropriate manner. So between IBM's enhancements to the database, the field procedures they've given us, or that capability, and PowerTech encryption, you can have a very seamless, rapid deployment of encryption and decryption in a strong manner that satisfies regulatory compliance. No discussion of security would be complete without some conversation around the audit functionality. It still shocks me every time I run the state of security report and determine that we still usually see between 10 and 15% of IBM I shops that are out there not utilizing this built-in, no additional cost functionality. Now, for those that are using it, unfortunately, many of them are not doing it correctly. So I've given you some tips here. Number one, change the configuration of the auditing facility to use a special library. By default, the journal receivers that are going to house this critical information want to be placed in the QGPL library, which is just not a good place for it. GPL is general purpose library, and this is not general purpose information. You want to make sure that you're collecting all the critical events. Oftentimes we see things like authority failures being omitted, which is arguably one of the most important security events you'll see. Now, understand that you'll only gain value from that authority failure if you have security configured in a way that would generate an authority failure. If your users are all running with all object special authority, don't expect to see an AF entry in your audit journal. So there is interaction like I you know, often say between many of these configuration settings, it's important that we understand holistically how the server is configured. Make sure you're retaining the information for the appropriate amount of time. That can range from 30 days to 12 months. It may depend on your regulatory compliance mandate, but reach out to externals to understand what this should be. 
it should not be defined based on the amount of free disk space you have. Don't empower an administrator to delete this data because you're running low on disk. This should be done at a more executive level to say, look, this is what we need to do, and we need to uh, procure the appropriate hardware in order to facilitate that. We want to make sure that we're performing some type of review. I, I did an audit for a customer that had experienced over 16 million invalid sign-in attempts against just one of their profiles. They were auditing it, but they had not seen those audit records and were completely oblivious to the fact that there'd been a brute force attack on their system. So it's great that you're collecting the data. It's always good to have something that you can turn back to and rewind. But ultimately, you want to have something that gives you awareness and visibility in a manageable task. Now, I say manageable, and I've got a bit of a smile on my face, because if you've ever looked at the audit journal, you'll know what an absolutely brutal task it is to go through that volume of events. IBM I can be very chatty. Uh, that's a good thing if you're trying to ensure that you've got a full picture of what's happening on the server. But if you're charged with the manual task of reviewing that, looking for that proverbial needle in the haystack, then you're probably not going to last very long. So automation really is a necessity. Some instances it's a nice to have, but here it is an absolute necessity. And we have compliance monitor that allows you to harvest and report on that data. We can compress it and store it on the system. We also have a SIM agent that allows us to send the events in real time to external logging solutions. So if you're using something like our event manager or QRadar, ArcSight, LogRhythm, Splunk, there are tons of those solutions out in the marketplace. We can communicate easily with those and they can do the slicing and dicing, the event correlation between the server and other servers, help bubble up the important events and, and uh, separate the, uh, the value from, from the noise being generated. Another tip, bear in mind that many of us still use the default IBM I sign on screen. There are some fields on here that you probably don't pay much attention to. You've probably not even noticed they're there or you've forgotten they're there. We see it so often. One of these items is actually the menu option for the user when they first sign on. Many of us use a menu attribute of star sign off which is a great way of telling the system that the profile that you're creating is not intended to be used for interactive sign-on. By specifying star sign-off there, once the initial program, if one is specified, has completed, then the initial menu directs the system to sign the user back off. Great for a service account or a group profile or something that has been created in order to own objects. What many of us don't realize, however, is that if we don't expect that user to sign on, we may not take the additional step of indicating that they should have limited capabilities because we think, hey, that's command line permission. But as I mentioned earlier, there's more to it than just command line permission. If you have star sign off on a service account and the user has non-limited capabilities, they can come in to the sign-on screen and override that star sign-off setting by just simply typing four letters in the menu field on the sign-on screen. M-A-I-N, main. When that user tries to connect, now the system thinks that they're intended to go to the main menu. So I recommend that this is an element of the sign-on screen that is rarely, if ever, used in this day and age and it really should be eliminated from the screen. Now, there are exceptions, of course, so you need to assess your own ability to, um, to do that, but IBM supplies the source code for the sign-on screen. A quick Google search will show you the instructions on how to kind of identify these fields, how to mask them. I'm not telling you to delete them. Uh, because the operating system handles the sign-on screen through an input buffer, you do not want to change the order of the fields. You ideally don't want to delete fields. But what you can do as a programmer is mark them as non-display and protected, which means that the user can't see them and they can't type in them, which is the net effect that we're looking for. So. Consider that as a very basic requirement. Many people still have not done that. And if you have long passwords, here my sign-on screen is just the traditional one through 10 character. If you have long passwords, you can still do this. You just have a different uh, source code uh, member to change for that long password. Again, 
Google search will help you with that. Otherwise, reach out to us and we can give you some pointers. Now, this one's a little bit hidden in the system, but as a knowledgeable user, I have seen it exploited and I know how to do it myself. What you want to be able to do is determine if a user can run a job on your system using the identity of another user. Yes, identity theft for IBM I. If any of these four criteria that I've listed here are established in your environment, then there's a very good chance a user can say, don't run the job as me, run it as somebody else. And it's possible that somebody else might have more capability and therefore provide the user with more access than you expect. If a user has all object special authority, they have permission to everybody's objects, not just their own. That includes user profiles. So as an all object user, I can say run a job as somebody else in the operating system thinks that is a perfectly legitimate function, won't even flag it as, as some type of uh, risky event. If I'm running a system that has a security level between 10 and 30, that's controlled by a system value called QSecurity. If you're between 10 and 30, then it's possible for a user to run a job as another user by leveraging a job description that has a named user on it. The operating system requires that the user submitting the job has permission to the job description, but it does not enforce the requirement that the user have permission to the named profile on that job description. Now it may log that there is an authority violation being uh, conducted here, but it doesn't prevent it from happening until you get to security level 40. So that's a really compelling reason why you wanna be running at least at IBM Q security level 40. If a user has private authority to another user's profile, in other words, Robin, you have permission to John's profile, I can obviously run a job as John. Now, there's sometimes reasons for that. I, I don't love it because I'm not necessarily constrained to the valid reasons, but at least it's constrained just to me. The last one here, the fourth item, is public authority to a target profile. This is not justifiable in my opinion. It is extremely common, um, but it's not normal. We should never have public permissions to a user profile as anything other than star exclude. If you want to find this out, you can run a print public authority command, designate that you're interested in user profiles that are not public exclude, and you'll get a list. There'll be three IBM profiles on that list that are okay. You will potentially see zero to many more. Um, Depending on what you see, certainly we can give you some advice in that regard. This is an item that is identified on the help systems uh, security scan. So another reason why running that versus your own manual reports can be beneficial because we'll determine if that's actually happening today. But again, with public permission, it means anybody can do it. And I just can't think of one valid business reason that all user profiles on the system should be able to run a job as somebody else. It's just such an easy way to circumvent security, especially if that target profile has something like all object. Then it's game over. I promised you some commands for accessing information about your system. I'm sure many of you are familiar with at least some, if not all, of these commands, but I wanted to list them here. Uh, the work system value is going to give you the ability to print off your system values. There's probably a couple of hundred of those values at this point, so it's not a real fun task to print them and then reprint them on occasion and compare them side by side. So again, that's kind of where the tooling is beneficial because it just avoids all the heavy lifting that we really don't enjoy doing. Let's focus more on the business aspects and have some type of application identify when there's an exception. If everything looks good, I don't need to waste my time looking at it. Printing the user profiles is, is going to be a, an ugly proposition for many of us to begin with. Uh, if you've got a lot of profiles, this is going to compound the issue. But the reason it's going to be ugly and messy is because most of us are still running profile configurations that are years and years outdated. Most of us copy our profiles from other users, or we use a template perhaps that has not kept pace with the changes to risk that we've seen over the years. So if, even though we're creating profiles in um, 2019, we might find that the origination point for that profile was 1994. 
And the world has changed a lot in that period of time. So printing the user profiles is a requirement. It's going to generate that, um, that ugly hoarding type view initially for most of us. But if you can get it into a more uh, clean state, then hopefully that's a, a maintainable view. But again, automation and, and uh, exception reporting can be very beneficial here. Print public authority, I just talked about, it, it is not limited to only identifying profiles that are not public exclude. It can actually find any object of the designated type. So use it to find files that are publicly authorized in an application library or find uh, job descriptions that are publicly authorized because um, those things are all important. Looking at your network attributes, determining if you use secure DDM, for example, um, that can be a beneficial command, as can config TCP, which is certainly not something you want the average user being able to do, but you want to see and understand if services that perhaps are non-used are still being started and are listening regardless of the fact they're not really needed. So if you've moved on and you're using um, a commercial application like our Go Anywhere for doing file transfers, then perhaps shutting FTP down is going to add some security value. I mentioned exit points. Uh, there is a registry that lists off all of the registrations between the exit points and the exit programs. Not really for the faint of heart to get in here, although it's not as bad as Windows's registry. Uh, again, the security scan will take a look at the important elements of the registry, determining if exit programs have been registered for antivirus invocation and for network monitoring. And so that's an easy, much easier way of determining whether this is an exposure area or not. Of course, when it comes to object level security, you've got various commands. Display object authority is, is a beneficial one um, to identify what is the public permission, what is the private permissions to that object, and who is that object owned by, all relevant pieces of data. All right, so that's perhaps a little bit ways down the road. I would start with the system values and then the user profiles. Many times we can set up compensating controls that prevent us from having to get too deep into the weeds. And so starting at the top and working down is, is usually advantageous before we get too stuck in the mud. Don't forget to over or don't overlook Navigator. Uh, checking your IFS drive share assignments is uh, very important. Oftentimes we find drive shares into the root folder of the IFS. That is an all-encompassing structure that includes the IBMI operating system and all of your native applications, and it's not something we want a user, or worse, a virus, touching. So using Navigator, we can identify what drive shares are there, whether they're legitimate, whether they've been or currently being used, whether they're set up for read-only or write capabilities, and so don't overlook that when you are securing your system. Bottom line here is this whole process should not be overwhelming, right? We often see this deer in the headlights look. We work with customers all the time. And when we go through and we analyze the state of the house and we find those piles and piles of garbage that we can't see the floor and most likely won't see it for, for a period of time, it just sends them into a tailspin. My encouragement is to start small, improve over time. We've got a lot of bad habits we've got to overdo. We're not going to be clean by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. But if you can stop the bleeding and then slowly back things up, you will see an improvement. Much like losing weight, we can be in the same boat or worse a year from now, or we can start and just make gradual improvements, and you'd be shocked at how fast some of these things can be remediated. You want to prioritize your actions based on the level of risk that the item presents and the time it takes to implement the solution. In other words, we want to go after those high-risk, fast deployment items first. In other words, you're getting the most bang for your buck. That can include things like exit programs. Perhaps it includes things like um, taking away all object special authority. It's great to address some of the secondary items and feel like you're making changes, but if they're not moving the needle very much, then you're spending time doing things that are really not going to benefit you much in the long run. So we want to go after those high visibility items first. We want to take advantage of authorization lists and group profiles. These are built into the operating system and they lessen the impact of authority tasks that we're going to be facing. If you've got 25 users in a department and they all basically need the same permission, treat them as one. 
Same thing with your authorization list. If you've got you know, a thousand objects as part of an application and they all fall into, say, that internal classification, then attach them to a single authorization list. And in a much easier format, we can now potentially authorize all hundred of those users that we're now treating as one to all thousand of those objects, which we're now treating as one, you know, just a couple of commands. So this does not have to be a mind-blowingly complex task. I've mentioned education. I've encouraged you to the security reference manual on IBM.com as well. Google and other resources are out there. We have tons of stuff on our website, but we're not the only ones. Educate yourself on this topic. It's going to be extremely beneficial for your company. It's also beneficial to you personally, right? Uh, there's no IBM I certifications, unfortunately, but there's lots of generic security certifications. And uh, just having this skill in this day and age is going to make you extremely valuable. Unfortunately, a lot of people still look at the security internally as you know the the management team is going to finger point if we don't have good security then we're going to get blamed for that because we didn't do it in the first place and the reality is actually quite different you are not typically chastised for bringing something like that to the attention because there is an assumption i think on a certain level within the organization that people lower down are just taking care of it and if there is a breach, then you know when the finger gets pointed, who it's going to get pointed at, and we don't want that to happen. As I mentioned, we've got lots of solutions that can help automate and simplify these tasks. It doesn't have to just be software. It can be services as well. Now, I don't know how many of you are really paying close attention, but I mentioned the word recurring on all of the primary actions, be it server level, user level, or data level. And that's important for a reason. Security does not take care of itself. We would not be here if it did. So once we do some of the cleanup, we have to implement tasks that are repeated. They need to be done on a recurring, frequent basis. Otherwise, what will end up happening is the system will fall back to its original default state, and we are back to square one. Many of us handle disaster recovery very well. We have great hardware. We've got a good operating system. We do our PTFs. We replicate to an HA system. We know and test, ideally, what should happen in the event of a fire or a flood. We've got all the roles and priorities defined, oftentimes in a runbook, that we know where it is and how to invoke it. So we know in a traditional type of disaster how to get our business back online quickly. Unfortunately, when it comes to disaster recovery from a cyber event, this can be a very different situation. Many times we're not recognizing that an event is even happening until it's way down the line. We don't know who to call. We don't know when we should call them. We don't have this defined. In fact, we're often defining it immediately that it happens or we discover that it's happening in doing so on the fly. Can you imagine coming up with a DR plan while you're watching your data center burn down? probably something that should have been done ahead of time, but that's what we do with cybersecurity considerations. If you are running HA, don't think that that's gonna save you because in this instance, you may find that anything that's done is not differentiated between good and bad. So yes, changes to the system that are authorized will be replicated, but a deletion of the customer master file is also replicated. So the HA is going to obey blindly. It does not have intelligence in there that says, I don't really think you should have done this, and I'm not going to do it here. If you're going to turn to your backup, just bear in mind that it could be that objects are touched only on a monthly basis, and they are already corrupted on the media. So that can cause issues as well. We want to make sure that we've got consideration of when we should notify regulatory bodies, you know, the affected entities. We've all gotten the letter from people saying that uh, you know, our data may have been compromised, and then we get a follow-up saying it's worse than we originally thought, or it's less than we originally thought. There's an appropriate time here. You don't want to be notifying too quickly in some instances because you want to perhaps determine the scope or perhaps set a honeypot so that you can catch whoever it is that's doing it. But you also don't want to wait too long. We've seen the impact of that regulatory and fine-wise uh, with lawsuits and everything else. Bottom line for me is that a bad plan really consists of a very straightforward do nothing. Doing anything is a much better plan, right? So taking action, 
no matter how much you think it's it's minimal, uh, moving in the right direction is going to put you in a better stance tomorrow than you were in today. If you're interested in learning about some of the um, settings that exist in IBM I and how people configure them, and are in many instances do not configure them, take a look at the State of IBM I Security Study. This is a report that we publish annually. It's available for free on helpsystems.com, and it will give you a lot of insight and value really telling the, the reality as to how secure our platform actually is. I mentioned that we have lots of uh, software solutions we can bring to bear. I mentioned a few of them today in the Exit Point Manager, the antivirus, the encryption, uh, but there's lots of other things that I think uh, could be valuable. But don't worry about that. Quite honestly, for me, the most important tool in our portfolio for our customers is the security scan because it's going to give us a much better understanding of where on the maturity graph you are. Are you just starting out? Do you have most things done? Because determining that will then establish your priorities and give you advice with regards to what you could, should, or need to do next. So my call to action here in the last minute is take advantage of that security scan. It doesn't cost anything. There's no obligation. We'll go through it line by line with you on a uh, go-to meeting or something of that sort so that you have some expert advice on how to interpret it, what it means, and uh, I definitely encourage you to take advantage of that. You can also pop out to helpsystems.com where you'll get trial videos and uh, downloads if you're interested in seeing about the products, but there's also lots of information that is non-product specific, blog entries, articles about IVMI security controls, and there you can really help to educate yourself. All right, so I'm going to open it up to any questions. I know we're at the top of the hour, but I'm going to hang out here for a few minutes. If you do have a question, if you do have to run, feel free to use my email or tweet to me here, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. It's been a pleasure to speak with you today. I am going to open up a very quick poll here for those of you that may be interested in having a, a security scan done. I just want to give you the option of being able to uh, to respond to that here. You don't have to decide now. You can always go out to helpsystems.com and um, that way you can um, make a decision later on if you want to. Entirely up to you. Just give you a moment to finish that. I'm gonna see what questions we have here. If you do have a question, use the chat window and I will be happy to answer those for you. If you want a copy of the presentation, I did upload that. You should be able to pull that from your toolbar there into uh, a PDF stance. Hopefully this was beneficial. As a reminder, I did record the webinar and uh, we'll make sure you get a link to that after we're done, as always. All right, I have a question here from Dave with regards to user profiles and determining special authorities. Um, Okay, you just you want to know what the special authorities are. Okay, so I mentioned that there are eight of them, and they all do eight different things, but what they are alike in is that they all are administrative, and we tend to give them to users that are not administrators. Uh, I'm actually going to be recording a new webinar on uh, all object, and, and we'll certainly mention the special authorities in, in their entirety during that session, and I'll be putting that out here. I think actually it might be my next webinar, so I'm excited about that. Um, but to answer your question, identify who has these privileges. You can Google on all object or sec admin. Bottom line, they're called special for a reason. The print user profile report will let you uh, select the users that have particular authorities. What you want to make sure is that you are checking to see if the user belongs to a group profile or more than one. And if so, whether the group profile has any special authorities themselves, because if they do, that is an inherited element that comes down to the member users. And a lot of people overlook that. So definitely take advantage of that. All right. Well, that's the only question I see here. So I think we're good. I am going to uh, close the poll out. I appreciate, again, you giving me that feedback. And uh, if you do have a desire to uh, to run that later on and, and um, you change your mind, then just head out to helpsystems.com and we'll be happy to facilitate that for you. All right. Well, that's everything that I have. I appreciate you joining me, as I said, and I look forward to seeing you on an upcoming webinar. And uh, I hope you enjoy the remainder of your day. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.